All right, we are live. Rick Mayo, Eric. welcome back. Thanks, Eric. How are you, buddy? I'm doing really well. I I, I always see, uh, you know, I look at my calendar on Monday mornings trying to figure out, you know, how I'm going to get through another week. And when I see Rick Mayo show up and as an interview, I'm like, ah, it's going to be a good week. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, <laughs> hey, I, always, I always have great com <laughs> I always have great conversations with you, and I learn a lot. I feel like you're, uh, you know. One of those people who, you know, entrepreneur, philosopher, uh, all of those things kind of, you know, mixed into one. So it's, it's, it makes really good conversation. I learn a lot. So, um, let's start with this man. Today is, uh, what is today? 11, 11, 21, and, uh, it is veterans day. So happy veterans day to all the people who have served. Um, but give us an update, Rick, what's, what's going on in your world. Last time we talked you were launching your franchise model. Yeah, we're still in that, really. So, you know, it's been a good year. We sold 35 franchises um, thus far, and most of them have been this year. As you know, we launched early 2020, which was not an ideal time to launch a fitness franchise because in certain areas of the of the country, certainly we weren't even allowed to be open. And so, you know, we, we that put a hold on our sales, understandably, and then we were back on it as the veils lifted a bit from this mess, um, you know, moving into this year. And so we're 35 sold. Got some open, have a lot more coming. Um, you know, actually have one in Montana, where, where you're in your home state, going into Billings, believe yep. it or not. That'll actually be the next one that opens. So they're in pre sales now. Yeah, but, Billings is an interesting place, man. It's growing pretty fast. I um, mean, I think a lot of like these little, you know, kind of mountain communities or, you know, more rural cities. Um, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Good for you. Billings is yeah, great. Yeah, what's the nickname for Bozeman now? It's like they're calling it something that has to do with Los Angeles, I think. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> all the folks, <laughs> yeah. all everyone. Yeah. Yeah. All the migrants from, uh, from LA ending up in Bozeman, Montana. But uh, I think they, they have a buddy that lives there and he's like, yeah, it used to just be trucks and farmers and ranchers. And now it's Range Rovers and you know, Porsche SUVs. Teslas. And Teslas. Yeah, exactly. There's Tesla showing up. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so completely yeah. different landscape, but that's what I've been busy doing. You know, we talked a little bit before we, we hit record today on just, uh, you know, going from having lots of irons in the fire to really trying to focus on the best opportunity vehicle that we have available to us, which is franchising, which has been a bit of an adjustment as an entrepreneur and so far so good. Um, but you know, we've got, we've got a long way to go. We're proud of what we've done so far, but we have a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would love to, to talk about that. I think it's a fascinating thing more because, you know, I think I can glean uh, value from, from that transition. I, uh, had some friends on the podcast and we all kind of joke that we call ourselves a multi potentialites, right? I always like to be working on like four or five, six projects. And I look at my days sometimes I'm like, what am I like, how am I mentally juggling all this? But you had mentioned, you know, kind of helps your entrepreneurial swirl brain, I think is how you referred to it. But how, how has that transition been from working on so many different things? Cause I, you know, I see your name in a lot of different places. You look at your profile. I mean, you, you've, you know, been on tech boards, you've been on, you know, I'm sure you've done a ton of advising and investing and all kinds of different things. So how is that transition going from so many things to now to, to one pure focus? I mean, it's, it's not been easy, I'll have to say. Um, it takes a lot of discipline, a lot more than I would have anticipated. So it sounds like you're going to be simplifying your life when you're going to, you know, give up some opportunities to focus on a better opportunity. I remember being at a talk that uh, Tim Cook, so the CEO of Apple, was speaking and he said, you know, we had, there was a, a pile of, of Apple products on the table and we were on these small round tops, maybe eight people there, you know, so e each table that is. And he said, listen, we, you know, Apple says no to more amazing ideas than you can possibly imagine so that the things sitting on your table can be the absolute best products possible. And so I think the hard thing is like, as you know, there's a bit of FOMO when you feel like you're missing an opportunity and you know, it, it goes back to me, you know, just because you can doesn't mean that you should, but that's really hard. It takes a certain level for me anyway. I've had to develop a certain level of emotional maturity to be able to look at, you know, and to look at an opportunity and it might be a good opportunity that might make a lot of money. Right. And so, and it might make that money fast. And so you're like, well, why would I not do this? Right. And it takes a, a bit of emotional maturity to say, well, listen, um, this will be a distraction. Even if it makes money, it's still a distraction. And this opportunity vehicle is short lived. It will be a quick grab, cash grab, whatever that may be. And ultimately, it's not the best use of my time or energy. 
And that goes against all of my entrepreneurial bones in my body. I mean, to be honest. And so it's been very difficult. And I would say it's been kind of what we talked about before where, you know, this, it's like a self grow self help or, or personal growth journey disguised as business. Right. It's like, it feels like what entrepreneurship is in a nutshell. And it's been a little bit of that. So I would say it's been very helpful in the sense that I've been able to direct all of my neurosis towards one, <laughs> one type of business. <laughs> I would also yeah. say it's been extremely uncomfortable at the same time, as you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah, I can. You know, there was, uh, I was mentioning it to you, book, uh, a book called Essentialism by, I believe it's Greg McCown. And it's one of my favorite books. I try to reread it <clears throat> every year, it probably ends up being every two years. But it, it talks about that as a couple of key things, which, you know, I could probably save people reading the book because I could just explain a lot of it right now. But his writing's great. Uh, you know, you, uh, essentialist really kind of, it's not, it's different than being a minimalist. You, you kind of poke around, you feel for, for soft spots and, and understand like what, <clears throat> things in your life align with your values and give you the greatest opportunity for your given definition of success. Right. And then you, you try a lot of different things and then you kind of finalize on one. And the other major thing that I, that I took away from that book is that there's always trade-offs. You mm. know, there, there's no complete win, win, right? Like, you know, I've talked to a lot of my coaching and advising clients about certain things like, well, I want this and this. I'm like, well, yeah, but you're, you're gonna, you're inevitably gonna have a trade-off. That's just the way it is. Like there's no perfect marriage, right? Where you got everything you want in your marriage. There's no perfect business relationship. There's no perfect anything really. There's just little things that you, there's things that you're willing to give up for, for something more beneficial. And it sounds like you kind of went through that same process as you were figuring this out. Yeah. And I think, I think I still will. And I think it's a great way to put it. It would be, I think if you weren't an entrepreneur, it would be odd to hear that you feel like you're sacrificing right? To, to put all of your eggs in a basket, right? And your attention, but that's what it feels like. I mean, quite honestly, because it's mm -hmm. not, it's, it's uncomfortable. And so, you know, working in this area of, of discomfort and sort of learning to, to deal with that and navigate that and still bring the same entrepreneurial spirit and juice when in fact it is a 20 mile March, right? It's your famous line from, you know, great by choice. It's like companies that could just get up and do work every day, you know, I've heard it described as do boring work or, you know, whatever those things are, but it's true. And it's very hard to do when, in fact, you are used to, you know, handling lots of different projects and you just kind of swoop in and you throw some advice around or, you know, and I've done what you've done. I've done coaching. We've had, we've owned coaching groups. I've owned like educational companies, licensing company, brick and mortar gems, invested in some other things. It's, you know, that's fun. A day in the life of, if you've got eight or 10 of those meetings and you're just like, you know, swooping in and making a few decisions and moving on. It's great. It's completely different when you are sitting in the same business entity and those decisions now have work that needs to be done. Some of it by me, not a lot, but some of it by me, it's a little <laughs> bit unnerving. And so, but I will say that, you know, it's, it's a little bit of, as your, as your skill set improves, um, you can certainly scatter shot if you want. And listen, there's, like you said, define your own success. Right. But for me, I think, as my skill set has grown over three decades, um, I think it's important that your opportunity vehicle matches your skill set over time. And so, you know, maybe I wasn't ready 10 years ago, even to do franchise, maybe that maybe licensing was the right choice until we could progress to franchising. But I will say, and this is really more of a credit to my team. Now that we're in the best opportunity vehicle, meaning it ha could have the biggest upside. It's the best thing for our for our customers or our franchisees, right? It's the best vehicle for success for them, but also for us, as you guys know, or you know, certainly, um, Eric, that a franchise structure is a much more valuable entity than an IP company, like a licensing only, right? And so it does have the biggest upside for us. And I will say that I'm really proud of my team because now that we're sitting in the most advanced opportunity vehicle, we're really shining, meaning like I'm really proud of my team that we have showed up with a very good product that we're taking to market. It's pretty buttoned up. We're getting good feedback. Validation has been great. Um, and I'm really proud of that because again, it's now you're, it's sort of like you're in the big leagues, right? You've worked your way up from brick and mortar ownership in college all the way through to the minor leagues and triple A, double A, whatever that may be. And now you're finally in the big leagues and do you really have what it takes? So it's a little bit unnerving. Um, but when you find out that you like at least early innings, we do, um, it feels good. It really does. So there's that side of it. 
but there's always the tempering of the squirrel brain, if you will, and to try to stay focused. That that's a daily challenge. Do you uh, just out of curiosity? Do you find that now this is your main opportunity vehicle? I love love that term, by the way. I'm gonna use it all the time. Uh, now you find this is your main opportunity opportunity vehicle. Um, are you still like? Do you have things that aren't career related that are kind of helping you with that? entrepreneurial creative outlet too on the side, because now, like you mentioned, I I would imagine there's a lot of the entrepreneur in you has got you here, but now you have that kind of plan and you're sure you're going to make, you know, minor shifts and pivots along the way, but you, 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 now it's execution, right? And uh, I know people who are, you know, very entrepreneurial sometimes have a, a challenge doing just the pure execution of things, right? They always, you know, like you said, the squirrel brain gets, gets going. So are are you, do you have other things in your life that are maybe kind of distracting that squirrel brain as well? Yeah. And that's a great point because what I don't want to happen, and, and this is what you, we all know that are entrepreneurs that are listening, you can fall victim to this. If you don't have a business structure set up where you can do many things, what may happen is that you just end up over tweaking your business, right? I mean, there's a, there's a theory of good enough and like our business is proving out to be good enough, but if every day I woke up and I needed to do something different, right? And I said, well, yeah, but I'm only working within this opportunity vehicle that I think gives us the best chance for success. Then I would just be completely over tweaking the business. And really what it is, is like a personal neurosis that's manifesting itself in my business. And you can ruin <laughs> your business. And so many of us do that. And I know you do a lot of executive yeah. coaching and you talk to people and you think, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, don't do, just double down on the basics that are, you know, the blocking and tackling, if you will, right? Quit doing all that. So 100%, it's so funny. We, we talk about this, you know, business disguise or personal journey disguised as business is I've literally been giving you know thought to like, all right, what kind of hobbies am I going to take on? Because I've got to have an outlet for learning and doing things differently, right? Because we are in a stage now where there's no sense in over tweaking. And certainly we're looking to innovate. Like we always say, innovate in the box instead of it's not always outside the box. Sometimes it's like, just make the thing better, right? And it's just slight tweaks that can do that. So always looking for those opportunities. But um, for me, it's 100% looking for ways to, you know, to satisfy that squirrel brain. And, and right now it's like, well, maybe I should take up archery or, you know, like I, motorcycling is my hobby. So I've signed up for some clinics where I'm going to track days and learning to race and like doing off-road racing. And I mean, you know, I'm looking at purchasing an old bike and just rebuilding it in the garage at night so I can just learn more of that. So like anything like that. Um, you know, to, or, um, you know, and of course, I'm, my wife thinks I'm nuts because every two days I'm like, what do you think about uh, me going back to jujitsu? She's like, didn't you get jacked up when you were going there? I'm like, yeah, but that was 10 years ago. Maybe I should go all the way through and get my black belt now. She's like, okay. And two days later, she's like, are you going to go do jujitsu? I'm like, no, that was a dumb idea. I'm going to rebuild an old motorcycle. She's like, you are? Yeah. I didn't, we don't even have an old motorcycle. I'm like, yeah, I've been talking to a guy on eBay. I've got one. It's in the state of Washington. I'm going to ship it out. <laughs> Two days later, I'm like, nah, I decided I don't want to do that either. So believe me when I tell you, it's still a, you know alive and well. It just It's trying to manifest itself in different ways. And I'm just trying to do my darndest to keep it out of my business. Yeah. Oh, God. It's it's so funny. I just resemble some of those remarks. I mean, when I was, uh, when I was you know, my my gym ownership days as an operator too. I was always launching a new program, tweaking something, completely shifting the program design, whatever it may be. And meanwhile, you know, I I was breaking things just so I could fix them again. And, you know, it was totally unnecessary when, if I had just, and I look at great gym operators who have been doing it for a long time and they, they have a formula, they stick to it. They probably take far more vacation time than I gave myself back then. Like, you know, they, they just seem to understand that principle, but I, I can't help myself. I mean, I think if I count right now between, I have like five, six different projects that I'm working on currently. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's well, thing. especially if you're, if you're yeah. with your insight, certainly deep, deep knowledge of a certain industry, it's, it's very satisfying to, to dig into complex problems, to be able to zoom out from crop duster height and kind of put all the moving parts together and, that's the fun part, you know, and then once you do that in a consulting, um, you know, relationship, like uh, probably like a lot of what you're doing now is you put all that together and then you just turn it over to them and you go like, just do this. Right. And then it's their responsibility to do the 20 mile march and, and, and do the day in day out. It's not yours. And that is awesome. But when you have to do that, I guess the best way to, you know, that I can say is just to hire the right folks. Um, it's been good for me. 
And so I, I'm, you know, I'm probably working less than I have ever. Um, but it's just more focused work and I'm making fewer decisions cause I'm not, you know, taking care of four or five different projects. I'm really just working on one thing, but within that one thing, um, you know, I'm not having to make as many decisions, but the ones I do are very impactful. And then we just scale, you know, hire people that are better than you at certain tasks and just get out of their way. I mean, I think I heard a CEO description, you know, very well where it's like the CEO should be able to identify that it needs to be done, but you're just not the one to do it. Right. And that's me. Like I can pick out all sorts of little things that we need to improve on or tweak this or, you know, bullets before cannonballs. Let's fire some things out and see if this new marketing play would would move the needle a little bit, you know. And so those are the type of things that, again, innovating within the box that I think as long as you're not too crazy and you don't like because what you can run the risk of is all this stuff rolls, you know, poop goes downstream. Right. So you can just bombard your team and they can just get super frustrated if you're constantly what, what seems like to you just being innovative, right. To them seems like you're changing your mind every other day and the initiative that they're working on is no longer important. And you got to be really careful with that. And that's just been a learning experience for me. So hire great people get out of their way. And then again, if you have some kind of need to do a bunch of things, just let themselves manifest themselves in different parts of your life, not in your business. Yeah, man. So well said. I, it took a long time to convince myself of this and then, you know, subsequently convincing other people that, you know, are in my sphere that, you know, you may love the decision making, the, the, you know, the quick start kind of mentality of, of, you know, I got, okay, this is, this is the direction we're going this way. Right. And I was like, well, I, wouldn't everyone want to have that role? Who wants to sit and actually execute day after day, month after month? And I was like, oh, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people just yes. want that, that structure the direction and they just want to go. And I'm like, wow, well that, and it took, I just couldn't wrap my head around it, nor could I also wrap my head around like the idea that I have a million ideas that run through my head every day. And not everyone does that. My wife was like, I'm like, don't you have like 10 business ideas every day as you're walking down the street? She's like, no, I don't <laughs> No, And I don't and I want like, to, okay. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can <laughs> yeah, I open like and it. close a business in 10 minutes, all in my head, like numbers and everything. Right. <laughs> And I'll, I'll, I'll be kitchen. I'll be in the kitchen with my wife. I'm like, you know, what would have been a cool business? And I'm like, you know, maybe it's something you could do. Like I'll do the franchise. We could do this. She's like, I don't want to do that. I'm like, but it's so easy. Listen to how we'll put it together. And then as I run through it and yeah. by the time I'm finished, she hasn't even had to interject at all. And I've already opened it and closed it and said, never mind," and yeah. left the room. And she's probably just like, all right. I mean, I'm pretty <laughs> sure she doesn't hear 99% of it. <laughs> because she's so used to it. I mean it's good to know that it's not just me. I'll tell you that. Oh, it's not. There's a lot of people I've been in the room and that's why it's, you know, I love getting into, you know, retreats or things with other entrepreneurs because you can talk about this stuff. You're like, oh, we're all relatable. Great. We're, we're all the freaks. But I was just, you know, for example, and then we can change it into a topic I want to chat about. But my sister, we're trying to figure out what to do with my mom in the next phase. She's unhappy with the place she's seeing is. she's 83 and she really wants to go on a cruise. And my sister's like, well, you know, too bad there's no cruise lines for just seniors. And I was like, huh? What if there was a cruise? What if it was a never ending cruise line? And once you retire, you just get on this boat. It's like an assisted living center on the ocean. And then you they just already float. Have that. Just I even have it. I even have a name dollars. for it. They already have one. Yeah. <laughs> there was a Do guy they? I knew from the fitness industry. His name was Tony DeLead. And he used to own some gyms actually in Atlanta called Australian Body Works. But he was a legend in Australia. And so he had yeah. moved back to Australia and he and his son opened a bunch of other concepts and I think Fitness First was one of their big ones, which I think is the same brand as Canada, but it's totally different. Anyway, anyway, he did great. Well, then eventually he took early retirement. He moved onto this boat and, and the condos were like exorbitantly expensive, but the boat was literally named the world. And all it did was just sail around from amazing port to amazing port. And you lived in a condominium on this boat. So that was your permanent residence. And it just moved around all the time. So it's been done. You just have to figure out how to bring the cost down and, uh, yeah, put some old folks on there. I think it would work out well. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to call it like sailing into the sunset, you know, Ooh, I like, like that. that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hey, um, I mean, I, I said I wouldn't participate <laughs> in any other business project, but, <laughs> but <laughs> this you're sounds in. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, this sounds brilliant. You can't That's go right. wrong. Why'd you uh, do that to me? Oh, Yeah. So, uh, one of the things I, I was, I'm really curious to get your thoughts on is, you know, you're selling franchises, you know, things are growing. You said 35, you know, plus I'm sure it's probably going to change every day. Um, and how, as we talked pre-recording about, 
what the pandemic has done to people's outlook on their profession, their life, their lifestyle, their values. And some people are calling it the great resignation, you know, but it's not just like, it's not just restaurant workers, right? It's people at, you know, senior VP levels or, or higher who are just having these dynamic shifts in what they're doing with their life. And I'm presuming that's coming into who's actually buying franchises or starting businesses and things like that. So I want to get your viewpoint on, on what's going on, you know, um, over the last year with people shifting in their dynamically shifting in, in their careers and their outlooks on life and their style of life and where they live. You know, what are you seeing? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a couple of things at play. So the evidence is clear what you just mentioned. There's been more business licenses applied for in since mid 2020 till now um, than there was, you know, in the last 25 years. So it, obviously there's a lot of people starting businesses, which is great. Um, and then also franchise sales. So overall, not just, you know, with Alloy, but franchises overall are, are really doing well right now. And of course, anytime there's a disruption and typically a downturn in the economy, franchising does well because it leaves some displaced, you know, folks that typically have, uh, you know, and, and certainly our customer avatar, you know, if you're 45 to 65 or, or, you know, might be a bit younger, but you've amassed a little bit of, of wealth, then you can afford to buy a franchise. So that's a perfect person, right. Who may, uh, you know, when their life is disrupted, they look at things and say, you know, I'm not really, I didn't really see it shaping up this way. As you know, Eric, you get, you know, you get into a career, um, you just sort of, and sometimes when you're younger, you just, you know, you're not really navigating, you're just sort of doing what you think you're supposed to do. And then you land somewhere and then you get some deep knowledge. And then pretty soon you're the CFO of a mid-sized company. And that's not bad. It's really not what you had mapped out for yourself. So I think when you look at disruption of any kind, you know, big retail has, has done so well with this. They know like if someone moves or has a baby or anything like disruptive in their lives, that's the perfect time to change someone's habits, right? And I would like you can remember famously, I think it was, oh, geez, I can't remember the book now, but essentially it was Target. It was featuring Target and how, what they did with uh, data. And they were able to predictively go back and, and look at you know baby registries and compare the buying habits of those people and then overlay that with new customers coming in. And they could predict almost in a in a creepy way who which one of their shoppers or which of the shoppers were pregnant. And because what yeah. they knew is what every retailer knows is if you can sell them diapers, you can sell them everything, right? And so it was really important for big retail to jump on these, like, again, people that have moved, people that are having a baby, any kind of a massive disruptor in your life is a perfect time to change someone's shopping habits, buying habits, whatever those things are, right? And I would say nothing's more disruptive than a pandemic, than a global pandemic. So even working from home, you know, um, it just, there's so many things that changed for people. I think it just, it forced people to kind of step back and say like, you know, is this really what I want to be doing? That in addition to the fact that there's you know, a lot of people stay in those positions because they end up having kids and they've got two in college and two in high school and they have a lot of, they have a lot riding on it. And there's a certain veil of security that comes with that. Now I would argue that I would always bet on myself before I would, you know, working for someone else and the decisions that, that they might make. But I would say that that probably is happening and that's in play as well, which is there's sort of this piercing of this veil of security, even though it's health related, it probably crosses over into career as well. And we're having lots of discussions for with franchise candidates that are, you know, solidly employed, making great money, you know, middle to upper level management who are just are saying, yeah, I'm, you know, 50 years old, I don't want to do this anymore. And I was a college athlete and I like working out and I like a subscription based income model. And so they look at fitness and they want to do good. You know, a lot of people talk about the, you know, the altruistic reasons to get into it. Like I want to change lives. I want to help my community, you know, those type of things. Meaning becomes a big deal. So I think there's a lot of things at play there, but you know, I, I think that's probably a lot of it. It's just the, the disruption of their life, first of all, which can kind of rattle your cage a little and, and force you to maybe look at other decisions. And I think, you know, piercing that, that, you know, veil of security has made people understand that like, you know, nothing's guaranteed, maybe even your health. Right. And so like, if that's the case, I'm, you know, I'm 40 or whatever that is, I need to get on and do what it is that I thought I'd be doing at this time. I want to take a shot at, at this myself. Yeah. That's what I, I want to ask you to expand on that with that thought. I've really liked that term piercing the veil of, of security, right. Of, of false security, I guess. And, and that certainly makes sense. I mean, in, uh, 
which book was it that I was reading? Um, was it Black Swan? Uh, it was one of those ones where it talks about, you know, what, what it actually means to be secure, right? Or what it means to become, and like, is, is the, the guy or the woman who's in that corporate job that's been there for 10, 12 years, right? Or is the taxi cab driver, right? Who's been doing it for 10, 12 years. Like who, who has the, op who's more secure in what they do? Like, sure, you know, one doesn't have, you know, health insurance and, you know, doesn't get a constant paycheck. They have to go out there and work for it all the time. Or is it this person who, you know, has all these things lined up, but then once the rug gets pulled, right, then what happens? So when you talk about that, that veil, like, you know, expand on that thought a little bit more. So I'm curious about it. Yeah, I think it's just the what you said. I, I think for me, I've only worked for myself. I've never really had a, a you know, air coach job. So I don't know what that feels like, but I can imagine in just speaking to candidates um, that it feels like you're somewhat stuck, especially if it's something you don't want to be do. And listen, a lot of the folks we talk to that are franchise candidates and, and think about this is like, it doesn't matter if they're looking at franchising or just considering being entrepreneurs. It's kind of one and the same, right? I'm just using the franchise lens because that's my vehicle to speak to people. So, um, but when we talk to them, a lot of them will say like, I don't, they don't dislike their jobs. They really don't. It's not like it's a toxic environment. And if it was that, they would have been looking before. But I think it's mm -hmm. just what's the disruption has been enough to just jog their, their thought process a little bit and have them say, huh, you know, I've had some time. Maybe they're working from home more and you just you're more efficient at home. So you have more downtime to just think about things you'd like to do. You know, a lot of people that find us online looking for franchise opportunities do it in downtime from home. And they probably wouldn't have done that if they were still commuting and working in an office setting and sitting in three meetings a day or something. And so the, I don't, I'm not sure exactly why that it is. I wish I did, obviously, but um, I think it's just a, a reality of, of the times and just the changes. I mean, things just feel different, right? I don't know. I would say off kilter or, you know, the, what is it? The new, the new reality or what's the, the new normal, the, the, silly new, terms. New, the new normal, this yeah. is the new normal, all, all of whatever them, right? that is. Yeah. But I, I just think it's that. And I don't think it's even disgruntled people that hate their companies or what have you. I just think it's um, it's just change, right? And it's been forced change. But once you sort of tip that glass, it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, I've survived this. I've always wanted to be self-employed. You know, I'd like to bring something to my community of value. And, I, you know, I kind of like fitness. It seems cool. Like, I, it's part of, like, their identity, right? I'd like to be fit. And so, um, yeah, I think it's just a combination of all those things. And I don't know if there's any other kind of psychology at play that I'm missing, but that's at least what we're hearing. Yeah. Yeah. It all makes sense too. I mean, we can only pontificate on what, what's going right. on. I would imagine too, there's like a certain element of, uh, you know, just being aware of your own mortality, kind of contemplating mm -hmm. that to a certain extent. I mean, I think you're spot on, like people just have more time to think what happens when you think you start reflecting, you start looking at your life's path. You start to realize like, you know, I'm turned 45 this year. I'm like, Holy shit. I'm half <laughs> technically over halfway there. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. um, like, ah, well, you know, what, 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 do I have regrets? Like, is it too late? And it's never too late. I think it's what a lot of people are realizing too, especially in that 40, 50 year old thing. Like you still got a lot of good valuable years as far as your profession or whatever it is you want to do. And it's not too late anymore. I mean, we can live multiple careers, you know, people, uh, you know, will live sometimes have five, six different careers in them, you know, over, over a period of time. And, yeah. And uh, you you think, know, that's, I think that's healthy. You no, know, a hundred percent. And, and you, know, you think long gone are the days where you, you work for a company your entire life and you work your way up and then you get a gold watch and a pension, right? It doesn't work that way anymore. I mean, you could be with a company for 30 years, they go through an acquisition and then your redundancy is eliminated and you're gone because they already had a sales team or they already had a CFO or whatever that is. Right. And, um, I think people realize that more now than ever. And so I think that there is some security because it's a steady paycheck and the, the folks that we're usually dealing with are getting paid pretty well. And so there's a risk of losing that. But I think again, just with a little bit of time to reflect, and a little bit of, uh, you know, looking in the mirror and maybe looking at their own mortality, even if it was like you, you think about like something like a pandemic and, you know, a virus. And it's like, well, what if I caught that? You know, what if I got really sick? I mean, I think everyone kind of goes through these mental exercises. And I think it just forces people to take stock of where they are and if it's really where they want to be. And if they are ever going to do anything, now's probably the time to do it. 
And so I'm sure that's driving a lot of it behaviorally for sure. Yeah. You know, I'm curious when you look at the people who are buying franchises right now and in your particular franchise, you know, I'll let you kind of describe it because it's, you know, in its uniqueness of the high end personal training. Well, let's start with that. Like give, give us, you know, what is unique about Alloy? Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're in boutique fitness and that's sort of a category in and of itself. So you've got like regular fitness and I would say regular fitness would be like, imagine just buying a membership at a gym, you know, you're a planet fitness or you're mm -hmm. an anytime fitness or something like that. And then there's boutique fitness and boutique fitness is everything from class-based concepts. So imagine like Pilates, yoga, cycling, spinning, you know, all those type of things, orange theory, F45 boot camps, you know, and those are just think of 20, 25 people getting sweaty, you know, on one end, that's, we would call it a class-based concept. And on the other end of boutique fitness would be one-on-one -on -one personal training. And so what we do is we kind of slot right in between the two and we do personal training. So we chase the same avatar, customer avatar that personal training would, meaning higher income level, you're looking for something specific, age category, 45 to 65, right? But we're able to do it at a better value because we, we do it in a six to one, you know, client to coach ratio. And we have technology and stuff that drives that, that makes it look, smell, feel like personal training. But in most markets that we're going into, personal training is, you know, roughly $100 an hour. We're able to do it for 30. So it's a good value proposition to the right avatar. So we're going after 45 to 65. And as you may know, Eric, like that population holds 70% of the nation's disposable income. So it's, it's a really relevant market, right? I mean, what better market to chase with a high-end service? Um, and the, the customer avatar for all the class-based concepts is typically 30-year-old, female-leaning, already fit. And again, that's why the churn rate in those models is somewhat high, because there's a lot of them in market, and they all chase the same customer avatar. And so it's really easy for the customer to bounce from one concept to the other and sort of cherry pick, you know, flavor of the week. Whereas with us, we're, we're attacking an underserved market with a good value proposition. Real estate and everything is obviously driven by that archetype. Um, and, and, you know, we only need a really small footprint. So it's 1500 square feet. So they're relatively inexpensive to open. Um, you know, and we need 130 to 150 members, it's super healthy, profitable model. So it's just a little bit different than what's out there now. Um, you know, there's not a lot of personal training brands that aren't doing one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and most fitnesses in the boutique section, certainly doing class-based concepts. So that's really what sets us apart. And it's something we've been doing and we've been in business for 30 years. We've been licensing for 15 years, 2,300 clubs worldwide. So we've had plenty of time and market testing and scaling things in other franchise structures to really know what's different and where there's a real gap in the market. And this was it for us. And so far it's proving out it's, it's easy to differentiate from other fitness concepts. And if the real estate's chosen correctly, which we do, and, and everything else in the brand speaks to that customer avatar, it works pretty well. So, so far so good. But yeah, that's really what makes us different is it's personal training, not class-based. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like the model Thank a lot. You. The, um, <clears throat> I'm curious, I've, I've worked with some in the past, I won't say the names of the, the franchise, but large franchises and kind of trying to figure out problem solve you know, mm -hmm. some of the issues that, that they have going on. And a lot of times it's been, you know, d identify, I'm curious, you know, how you guys identify so far and what you sold, like who are the key types of avatars who buy these things? Um, you know, is it kind of the whale investor who owns, you know, a hundred different franchises? Is it the, you know, the, the person who's, you know, been a, a professional for 20 years, a dentist or a, you know, VP of something who now wants to get into this, or is it like, you know, the, the owner operator who, you know, maybe has been in fitness for a while, like who, who are the people who are buying these? It's a little bit of all of those. And I, I think when we, when we thought about bringing a franchise to market, we didn't want to be, you know, an exclusive franchise. Uh, we'll say we wouldn't, we didn't want to appeal exclusively to say personal trainers that wanted to own a business, right? That would mean that we're probably going to go one territory at a time for each franchise sold, right? And, we're, and we may be attracting folks with a little bit less business acumen. That's all. And that's not a derogatory term because certainly if someone like that can qualify, and that's another thing is, you know, a young fitness professional may have struggles qualifying. You have to have a certain net worth and liquid, right, um, capital to qualify, then then we have to be able to appeal to investors. So there's really three types and we've actually sold all three types already. So there is the owner operator. So this would be someone who's maybe leaving corporate. They look at fitness and when they realize that they can replace and typically exceed their income, even if they're doing well, um, it's surprising. And they're like, well, this is exciting. 
Well, I, they really like fitness. They're typically consumers of it. Like, you know, one of our um, franchisees in, in Utah, she was a, you know, head of her, her, you know, she's a computer programmer, head of her department, big company, very successful, and was just a consumer of fitness. She worked out at a personal training place for the last 10 years, started looking at it, wanted a new small group was more scalable, bought the model. She's going to work in there. So she's literally going to leave corporate and go work and be her own manager, director and work in the gym. And it's a job, but it's a cool job if you want it, right? So there's that person. Now we have other folks that are leaving um, corporate and they're going to do three to five locations and they have no plans to work like, you know, service revenue, like train people in the gyms, but they're not going to continue working. They're going to do community outreach, back office support for their operating partners, that type of thing. So that'd be semi-absentee. So they're there, but they're not really there. They're not working in the business every day. And then we have full on absentee, which is usually these big investment groups that come in that are looking at us that have, you know, 70 or 80 other brands, you know, similar. Like we talked to some guys this morning who own you know, multiple brands um, that are in the service based space. So they really understand franchising and how to scale it. And I think all three avatars are interesting for us. Obviously, you can scale much quicker um, if you're working with big fish, as you said, or whales. So for us, that's really important. And our model does work with that. But I know it sounds cheesy, but like, really, we can work with all of them. If it's a one-off person, they're hard to beat. You know, if a guy buys it, he's going to work in there every day or a girl. It's like, they're going to be pretty darn good. They're going to be hard to beat because they own the place. Right. But that's probably not the best way for us to scale. And so we have to have it set up. So both types of avatars and semi in the middle there can actually work. And that's what we're seeing so far is we're getting a little bit of everything. Cool. I'm curious too, when you have kind of the, the middle one, right? The one who isn't an owner operator, but doesn't want to be hands-on all the time. How difficult is it, is it for them to find staffing? Cause that seems to be talent, you know, is tough to find nowadays necessarily. I mean, hard to find, but then even harder to lock down in the long term, right? Yeah. I mean, big time. And it's, what's weird is we haven't had a problem. And I think it's the structure, the way that we have it set up. So the way the labor model is set up, it's, it's a low labor model, first of all. So I'll say that, you know, it's 1500 square feet. Again, you're at 130 to 150 you know, clients or members, if you will, as a really healthy model, great margins. And so when you're, if you weren't going to work in that model and you were going to hire what we would call the general manager, that would be the internal term, but consumer facing, we would call that director of training as an example. This person is going to service about 25 hours a week of revenue. So think about the, you know, again, layman's terms, they're going to personal train groups for about 25 hours a week. And the other 15 hours a week, they're going to help grow the business, right? Well, in our model, if it's run correctly with a salary, and then if you do some type of profit share, which we'd recommend if you don't ever plan on going in there so that this person is so key for you, right? That's a six-figure job. So you can imagine someone who, um, say you're the PT manager at a large health club, you know, you're at a LA Fitness or something like that. Well, you've typically got a very top heavy management structure. You've got ridiculous KPIs and sales, you know, quotas that you have to meet. And, in, and you're on this never ending hamster wheel of churn, right? You're losing clients, you're selling clients. You're losing, it's just this nonstop sales all the time. Nothing wrong with sales. I mean, we, we teach it and believe in it heavily. Obviously you need it, but to always be doing that and nothing else, that person's probably making 65, 70 K a year, right? Maybe. Um, and they're just working, they're working 10, 15 hours a day. Again, it's not typically the greatest work environment. So if you, if you approach the person like that and said, listen, um, you know, here's an opportunity to come and be a coach, just be a head coach. And yes, there's some sales involved to get ramped up, but our churn rate's only 3%. So if you're only churning out 3% of 130 wow. clients a month, it's three people. It's a whisper that there's a spot open on Tuesday, Thursday, 8 a.m. and you fill it up, right? So you really becomes, you get to, get to actually be in the fitness business. It becomes more about servicing revenue and taking care of people. And that's why that, that small number is important, right? It's like a flock that you're taking care of. That's a pretty appealing job. And so I can tell you that we haven't had a hard time filling it thus far. Even the part-time trainers that cover the other hours, you know, they're at a rate of, you know, the way the performance set up, they're at a rate of $35 an hour, which is pretty good pay. And they're on a shift. So even with those, you know, factors in there, that payroll is less than 15%, which is really low for if a personal training model, because typically if you're doing one-on-one -on -one training, you're paying out half, you know, of what you're charging to your coaches. So this is all in manager salary, everything less than 15% for payroll. So pretty cool the way it worked out. So we specifically haven't had any trouble just because the positions that we're offering pay really well. 
and they're typically appealing to people that are in the fitness industry. We have a vendor that just does talent acquisition in fitness, and we've written the the uh, ad script for this position. And so far, so good. I mean, the last one I can think of, the guy in Montana, he lives in Butte. He's opening in Billings. That's a three-hour drive at 80 miles an hour, right? So he, sight unseen, launched an ad for this position in Billings, got 10 great candidates, pared it down, had a harder decision choosing one, but ended up with one. And uh, they came to training, you know, a month or so ago, and this guy's a total rock star. So it bodes well for us long term with the processes and everything we have in place to be able to identify this person. Um, but yeah, I, I know a lot of gyms are struggling, but this model doesn't have a lot of lower paying positions, put it that way. So I'm not looking for front desk or cleaning crew or, you know, those type of things just don't exist in this model. So it makes it a little bit easier for us mm -hmm. than most. Yeah, that's great, man. And I'm, I'm all about, you know, I think, uh, especially of being an operator of mostly large group classes was the model I had. It was, it was tough to, I wanted to pay people more. I always did. I had no problem doing that, but I also had to, you know, make sure I was taken care of and overhead was always large and, you know, these big facilities and, um, you know, it was tough. It was a tough game to play. And you always, you know, I'm, I'm always really excited about, you know, it kind of advancements or models that I see allow people to make six figures and stay in this business and be passionate about it and love it and, and stick around for a while, because that's what makes the industry more professional. No, right? I totally it's agree. And, and that's an intrinsic, you know, motivator for me because I've been in the industry so long and I've seen so many people come and go because it's just so hard to break through and actually get to that point where you can actually make a living and make it stick. So to provide a vehicle that not only provides the franchisee, you know, with an opportunity to, to see a good return on investment and make a great living, but it also then provides their team, right? So they can actually go and provide someone in their community, a six figure opportunity and shoot, if they want to go a step further, um, you know, you could even do some phantom equity on the back end. Like, Hey, I'll give you right of first refusal. If you mm -hmm. want to buy it, how about a 10% phantom equity if we sell it, right? That type of thing. Um, wow. And you can even tie those things to employment. So it's like it kind of makes it stickier for them as well, right? Because the franchise agreement is 10 years. I mean, will you keep the same operator for 10 years? I really hope so. If you pay them well and there's some upside long term, you might. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm a big proponent of taking care of, of those of your folks and I'm proud to have a vehicle that can do that. Ultimately, it makes me feel good because, again, how many folks have you and I run into in the industry that just they're really good at it? But again, it's that they're in that low opportunity vehicle with a high skill set and they just wash out. It just make, doesn't make sense. They look around and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rick, uh, unfortunately <laughs> time has run out. I'm Man, sorry. I, I, I have like three more things. I know I had three more things I want to ask you about, Rapid but, fire. uh, you know, I guess I just means I'll have to come, have you back on, man. Ma, it's uh, it's to, been man. really good. And, um, yeah. So just give us the goods really quick. Where, where do people find you? Where do you want to send people online? Well, you, as, you, as everyone knows, that's been listening. I'm only in one place now. So I'm very easy to find it's just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one place in one place only alloyfranchise.com. It's that simple. Certainly I'm on social media all over the place. So check us out, but alloyfranchise.com, you know, we have a podcast as well. It's very niche. It's just about the business of personal training, but if you're interested in that, or you want to hear more about some of the things we talked about today about the model itself. Um, feel free to jump on there. You can find that through that website as well. But yeah, that's it, man. I, I really appreciate uh, the time as always. And you're right. You know, I think the first time I ever met you, I'm like, I could, could probably spend five hours talking to this guy about all things technology, you know, <laughs> technology and fitness and everything else. So apologies to the listeners. I hope they got something out of it, but I sure had a good time. <laughs> yeah, I did too. Uh, right on. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Mayo. Thanks, Eric.